Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? As I uh, did a little bit of microphone work, so I should have better sound quality now. <clears throat> um, <laughs> I also decided to open up Age of Wonders 3 just so you guys have some eye candy. Yeah, Age of Wonders 3. Um, which is a great game. Um, a little bit of background before I begin. Um, I first started playing uh, fantasy strategy games, I think when I was like 9 or 10 years old or something like that, maybe younger. And I'm 34, so, you know, back in my day, we had a, we had a game called Master of Magic that uh, was kind of a Civ-oriented strategy game, but it, um, you know, it had magic and had different races and it had a really, really exceptional system for its time. And ever since then, games have been have been trying to to copy or replicate that process. <clears throat> and of all the different games that have been made since then, Age of Wonders three was the was the closest clone to um, to that concept. Um, <clears throat> the game is very advanced already, isn't it? No. <laughs> so obviously, um, so obviously, a lot of you have heard that I, I, long term I want to be able to make my own fantasy strategy game, but um, do everything with it that I'd, have, that I'd ever wanted to do with it. So, you know, as a kid, when I was looking at, um, you know, when I was looking looking at these fantasy games, I always wanted, like, for there to be <clears throat> real ecosystems and real economic systems in these games. Um, so, for instance, when you, when you see monsters roaming around and guarding things, I wanted them to actually um, have their own interests and, and, and to be breeding and to be um, trying to survive in the wilderness and it wasn't just that they were sitting around waiting for you to go and, and beat them and take their treasure right I want there to be rich history behind um, behind all of the places in the world and uh, I wanted the world to be alive and, and dynamic and so <clears throat> long term with um, the game concept uh, songs of the aeons um, I wanted to take all the best things that we that we enjoy and like about fantasy strategy games and insert all of those concepts um, that uh, <clears throat> that I've wanted to add for so long, and you kind of got to see a lot. You know, a lot of those concepts and work with um, with M and T two point oh, which by the way I do I do intend to continue to support and work on. Um, <clears throat> but um, you know, I'd like to take a lot of a lot of those concepts and a lot of my background, my educational background in in biology and ecology, and apply those principles. <laughs> Monsters guarding crypts have families too. That's a revolutionary concept, right? So, the idea, right, is that as you have a lot of races, you would have a lot of races in the world. Um, some would be more prone toward building civilizations and things of that nature, and others would be uh, creatures that were more prone to living off the land, like your trolls and your ogres and things like that. Um, and regardless of the case, each type of race would be would be breeding and would be trying to expand into into new ecosystems and and um, and a attempt to better themselves. <clears throat> yeah, Tima Alexander, I believe we're still on track for um, June twenty sixth. So keep your eyes open. <clears throat> um, yeah, we're, we're sorting out the details on that end, but. Um, yeah, so the idea behind uh, the stream today is I wanted to um, a explain the concepts a bit better to uh, to various people um, of of songs of the aeons, the game I'd like to make. In addition to uh, brainstorm about what to include in a in a formal description. Um, for a lot of views, there's that. <laughs> Yeah, Cowboy is a mod. <laughs> He's finally finagled his way into... Yeah. When will the songs of the Aeon Season Pass come out? <clears throat> but anyway, um, we already have... Um, we already have a number of... Uh, a number of places where you can participate uh, in the community with uh, the development of the songs, songs of the Aeons. We're obviously still in um, formalizing key concepts and deciding what language we're going to use and 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 uh, <coughs> well and <coughs> excuse me i'm sick again by the way um this is why i haven't streamed for a while i lost my voice again but um we got a number of places so we got our discord channel right which we're discussing a lot of things <coughs> a lot of things about the actual game to be made as well as um as well as uh you know a few other things related to the new game developer um, I'm I'm peeking over at um, at Twitch as well. 
Cowboy looks like he's answering a lot of questions, which is nice. Um, and so I'm kind of bouncing back and forth between both. Um, how many people have we got on Twitch right now? Twelve? So okay, audience isn't too bad. Um, so we're right, we got the Twitch channel. Um, I believe... All right, yeah, we have the Discord channel here, which I believe we have uh, in, in the description of, uh, of YouTube. Uh, I think there's... I uh, don't have a link to Discord currently in, um, in the Twitch channel, but we can... I think Cowboy can throw up a, a link. And, um... <clears throat> That's our Discord channel. We have a forum up now too, which I'll try to include. It's, it's still kind of in its opening phases, but that's right, so we're discussing some various topics <clears throat> as, as far as the game design is concerned. What I'll be doing is I'll be I'll be running a, a column on a regular basis, um, talking about the journey of, of developing at each each phase of the way. Some of those columns will in include key concepts in the game, which then everyone can discuss and, and say what they'd like to see and what kind of ideas they think would be cool. And then we'll formalize those ideas as time goes on. Um, I'll still be doing development pushes or development sprints with, uh, <clears throat> with Mio and Taxes 2.0. And I'm also gonna attempt to make some videos um, for uh, M&T 2.0, formal and short tutorial videos of each, each major feature. <coughs> Because part of the game development journey is also is also what I've experienced with modding as well. So I'm not gonna not gonna give up on that entirely. By the way, by the way, Age of Wonders three was a pretty good game, General von Gallery. But um, <clears throat> obviously, what I want to do is is uh, involves quite a bit more depth. Obviously, probably less eye candy, but you know, a lot more depth. And something I intend to develop for a very long time into the future. So it's something, you know, to make it into the game that it, I want it to be in that, uh, you know, I personally need it to be, it'll take, you know, we'll have prototypes along the way and, and functional games along the way, but I'd like to work on it, you know, 15, 20 years, something like that. Um, and then eventually I'll be um, releasing my Gaming Rebellion column. Which I alluded to. Which you'll be able to find at Gaming Rebellion. You can see the NGD forum is accessible there as well. <coughs> so I'll have my column up on the front page. <coughs> Let me check comments real quick. Game Rebellion for the win, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> H-War-G, will the map be colored so as the province is its terrain type color or Grand Strat Nation color? Um, You'll see the terrain color because the thing is, so you know we have our own game. Um, you know it'll be similar in this regard because you'll need to be able to see the qualities of the different tiles visually, um, and there will be a lot more variables going into into the terrain types um, in Songs of the Aeons. You know because you have <clears throat> you have you know, the land which is capable capable of sustaining different types of populations and different densities. And um, we already have some discussions on the forums about um, some of the details of how the ecology will work um, and how um, you have a, a fundamental dichotomy in a lot of cases between wilderness and civilization. And the more wilderness covers a contiguous area, the more dangerous it tends to be for civilizations. You know, you have more more monsters that live there that are capable of leaving and, and raiding civilized areas. <coughs> but um, anyway, I'll uh, I'll bounce out of Age of Wonders three. I think I don't want anyone showing up thinking that this is the actual game, but I thought it'd just be fun to to jump in there real quick. 
Excuse me. Um, okay, so... I'd like to go ahead read a, a shorter description that we had pinned um, that we had pinned to the Discord channel. Um, I'd like to expand on this today to come up with an official description that we can give to um, uh, to people who are interested in the game. And so I thought, like, oh, what's this whole Songs of Aeon things about? And we could be like, hey, here's a you know here's a one or two page description giving you the general idea. Um, Maybe even shorter, but but something that um, something that doesn't overwhelm people. But if you know when they want a little more meat, they can they can get into it. Uh, when the world is generated, will you bother simulating the creation of landscape, or just randomly generate? Uh, yeah, Capitan Kosovo. Um, long term, the idea is to have a geologic system. By the way, um, so the idea is you have right the geologic aspect. Um, which is which is determined by you know a, a fundamental like plate tectonic system and things like that, <clears throat> and then you would run that you would you would proceed when you make a world you procedurally generate that, and then you run it for you know x number of years so that you have a you have a stabilized terrain, <clears throat> and then you run a ecological generator on top of that, and the ecosystems will tend to to generate in places where they uh, make geologic sense, right? Um, and so rivers, rivers will flow, uh, you know, toward lower elevation through, uh, you know, through less, uh, they'll tend to flow toward uh, less solid uh, sediment and things like that. And then you will, and then we'll generate, generate an ecosystem on top of that, <clears throat> run the ecosystem for a while. And then on top of that, you have the various races and civilizations and, and wilderness races um, living on top of that ecology based on based on what the environment is capable of sustaining. So that's that's the general idea. But um, so the description reads, um, Songs of the Aeons will be a fantasy world simulator wherein a player leads a society through an undying fantasy world which evolves with the passing of Aeons. Harnessing real-life principles of geology, ecology, and economics, all things that exist in Songs of the Aeons world exist for themselves, not as a gaming means to challenge the player. Events in the game aren't scripted. They emerge as logical consequences of a complex ecological and economic system. Monsters aren't spawned in dungeons to mill around until they are defeated by the armies of civilization. Instead, at one point earlier in the game, they became overpopulated in the bad, bad lands yonder. A troop of them broke off to migrate the greener pastures, and they slaughtered the civilized folk that lived there, making an old abandoned castle their new home from which to hunt, survive, and breed. The undead necropolis in that burned out city wasn't plopped down at game start for the sole purpose of being purged and pillaged one day by the player. It's there because it was set to sacking a hundred years ago and its citizens were murdered and left to be left in the streets to be picked by the crows. Growth and decay will exist in equal measure and as civilizations are destined to rise, they are also destined to be extinguished. At the moments of these, as the monuments of these forgotten societies gradually grind down to dust and yours rises, you will one day face a calamity and similar fate to the very civilization that lie in ruin. Perhaps you might survive the first, maybe the second, maybe the hundredth. In time, though, it will be some peoples of the future picking over your ruins, deciphering your deeds, just as you had done to the peoples of the past. All that will, all that will remain is the song that your people sung during their time to echo through the aeons. So, <laughs> no man's sky. Um... But yeah, the um, <laughs> I've said the same thing myself, right? Um, so, you know, the philosophy behind development of Songs of the Aeons, I want to be a lot different than a lot of conventional games. So, what typically happens with most games is you you um, you know you get a bunch of investors, they pour money into it, you hire a bunch of people, and then you're you're working on this time this this frantic timeline, trying to live up to all of your pro your all of your promises. And then you, invari you invariably can't, right? Um, and um, and so I'd like to um, approach the new game developer with a significantly different philosophy. And that is more of a grassroots perspective where you start with one person, you gradually build over, t you gradually build over time um, to such a point where I have enough time where I can, I can go full time at the project. And then, as um, as we get more uh, as we get more under our belt, 
are able to attract more people who are interested in um, in, in in financing the game. At which point you can start to you can start to hire more people on, um, and you take it you take it slowly and steadily to build out core concepts. Um, and um, let's see. Yeah, so Hagwar yeah, yeah, Wargi <clears throat> yeah, we're we won't be um not gonna be giving I mean this is this, this so this project technically um is supposed to be a twenty year project. We'll have um we'll have versions of the game available and playable before then, obviously. But the idea is to make it my life's work and to continue to build on it over time to make it to make it better and better. Um and to add more and more of the things, more and more of the things we want to see eventually into the game as time goes on. Um, Path of Exile. If any of you are familiar with Path of, Path of Exile, I'll bring that up now. <coughs> I've really taken a lot of inspiration from from Path of Exile, which is not a strategy game. It's a action RPG. I'll get a YouTube video of it up. Actually, let's see. Path of Exile um, is an action RPG, um, you know, like Diablo type of game, but um, of course, tons of gear and stuff. But their strategy was they went they went for a long term plan, right? So they they um, they declared that they were going to make this a fifteen year pro, you know, fifteen or twenty year project. Um, and that they would gradually build on it over time. And they started out in a similar vein to how I'm trying to start out now, which is, you know, they had some people who believed believed in the core mission and believed in the people that were working on it. Um, and they, you know, they spent, spent the initial years getting, getting a general prototype down. Um, and then, you know, after a few years, they were, they were able to release something to show for their work, um, which, was, which was fun and that people play. That's kind of when I kind of joined in and started contributing. And then as time went on, they became more and more professional and, and were able to monetize more and more, bring more, bring more developers on. Um, and they still are determined to, to continue with that, um, you know, with that, uh, that roughly 15 year time frame where they were just going to turn it into the ultimate action RPG. <clears throat> and so that's, that's their ambition long term. Um, and that's similar, that's similar to, um, um, that's similar to the strategy I'm going to be I'm going to be pursuing as well. Um, let's see. <clears throat> yeah, well, Johnny Con, there's yeah. As far as Path of Exile is concerned, you say it looks like a Diablo three ripoff. Um, it actually came out roughly the same time as Diablo three and has been in development longer than Diablo three. It was actually it's meant to be a Diablo two ripoff. Um, but of course, you know it's a genre, right? Action RPG. There's tons and tons and tons of games that are like um, uh, that are quote unquote like Diablo, and, and games came before Diablo. Just like <clears throat> just like Songs of the Aeons is technically a ripoff that of um, of the original Master of Magic, which was one of the first games to do what it did, you know. Um, except that it's it's taking it to the absolute. Uh, highest detail and quality that, that they can get. Path of Exile is significantly more sophisticated and complex than, than Diablo 3. Um, and Songs of Aeons ideally will be um, will be more sophisticated as well. And it, I intend it to be fully open source to um, Songs of the Aeons and very, very community oriented. So um, It'll kind of so. For instance, um, Path of Exile's monetization strategy is that they don't have you don't buy the game as a unit, right? They have a what they call an ethical, um, an ethical monetization system, and so it's not pay to win. You don't pay money in order to get special advantages or special gear or buffs or anything like that. Um, but they have a variety of ways in which they can get money from you know from donations, which give you kind of prestige in the community or um, or cool little effects and stuff like that you can add to your character. 
Um, Demian, why did you change the channel name? Um, because um, Nikos, this is the direction I'm going to take it in the future. I'm still going to be um, still gonna, still going to be working on M and T some of the time, but I feel like I really have to <clears throat> take the skills I've learned in modding and take all the time that I've spent modding um, and and be able to at least move in a direction that has um, that has more growth because. You know, I'll go crazy. I'll go crazy with M and T and their limited language. Um, if I, if I if I can't feel like I'm moving in the right direction, <laughs> break every mechanic of your game in the DLC and charge fifteen dollars a piece. No, that's definitely not the method, Capitan. Um, right, but the idea is to actually be able to to be able to to harness the power of of uh, of the community at large. And long term, be able to allow the um, the community to be able to create their own content, which can eventually be integrated into the the canon game itself. Um, and so, for instance, right now, you know, in Europa Universalis Four, um, none of the stuff that the modders make ultimately make it into um, into the game itself, right? But the idea with Songs of the Aeons is to actually be able to have a system by which um, uh, player made content can be integrated into the game itself. <clears throat> yeah, I agree, Nate. PoE has by far the best F2P system in place I've ever seen or experienced. Yeah, I agree. Um, anyway, I was showing you Path of Exile um, mainly because I wanted to discuss their their monetization strategy and um, and how they how they do business and how they've been able to take. A strategy of long-term development and turn it into um, and turn it into something viable. I think they've done that for sure. They've created, <coughs> in my opinion, the most sophisticated and interesting action RPG, the most cerebral action RPG on the market, and also do it with an, an unorthodox um, monetization strategy that um, doesn't revolve around having people constantly buy new DLC. Um, or else ruin the game for players and not rely on pay to win mechanics which milk like 1% of the you know uh, you know tragically addicted community yeah yeah Capi Capitan Kosovo that's another thing as well you know there's stuff like that that you can add to the game <clears throat> yeah Petro I'm afraid um, <coughs> the um, Trebizond campaign is is uh, I'm not sure I'll be continuing continuing it or, it or not. Um, one of the problems is I just got sick, and so I couldn't stream while I was yuck. <clears throat> but after, and so I took some time to work on work on all the peripheral stuff with um, with the new game developer. <clears throat> but I also want to be able to um, spend spend the time coming up making M T 2.0 tutorial videos, and then work on canals as well. So that's probably more important than conti continuing the Trevizon campaign. Yeah. So sorry. Will there be Granada in Songs of the Aeons? You bet. Yeah. So one of the big things with um with Songs of the Aeons is it is a it is a pure a pure simulation pure simulation game. Um, I'm just gonna open up some Master of Magic gameplay stuff real quick, just so people can see it <clears throat> while I talk. But, uh, this is the old school game that got me into, got me into the whole concept of um, fantasy strategy games. But um, but you know it's a full you know Songs of the Aeons will be a full on simulation game. So um, so you're once again it's it's a lot like MT 2.0 where you are less of a god king and more of a um, <clears throat> A more of an actual government which has limited power to to influence change <clears throat> on the world so it won't be like Civ where you are micromanaging what workers go where and and things of that nature um, yeah development is more important than game gameplay I, I agree true <clears throat> but um so where was I? Um, so yeah, Songs of the Aeons will be uh, 
will be very simulation oriented. And so your, your people and your civilization will be doing a lot of things on their own based on their own interests. And your role is to guide them and to, uh, and to try to uh, manipulate their behavior into doing the things that you want. Um, as opposed to necessarily direct direct influence. You'll have some direct influence in the sense that you will have control over your own professional army and things like that. Um, but your society will actually evolve based on the conditions that they are subject to. And so, you know, a bunch of humans living in the living in the deep, dense forest over time will gradually evolve into a ranger warden type society. As a, and if they were once, you know, agriculturists, agriculturalists who lived in the in the plains, they will gradually shed those attributes and take on the attributes of, of wherever they happen to be living. And you, as the ruler, will have some influence over that, but um, but uh, <coughs> it will um, you know, the, the the conditions that your society is subject to will will determine largely the the evolution of your society. <coughs> Yeah, Capitan, Capitan Kosovo. So if you're like, you say, so your comment is, well, we have the level of control over our city to cut down every forest nearby area despite the woodland creatures still in our food. I mean, you can, so for instance, <clears throat> to some extent as the central government, you can do that depending on how much control uh, your society has and how much how much surplus it is, it is generating. <clears throat> but um, if, there's a, if there's a big dark forest nearby where lots of, Lots of gnolls live, and they're coming out, and they're they're raiding your, um, you're, they're raiding your plains society, and destroying farmland, and and, and taking away, uh, taking away cattle and stuff like that. You can, you know, build forts along the forest, and then, as your people attempt to clear the forest and settle it, you can protect them so that they can gradually, you know, destroy the very habitat of the creatures which are causing you problems. Right. <clears throat> And Kukumaro, you'll be you'll be mainly the government as opposed to some kind of god spirit type of type of organism, right? So you will, depending on how depending on how organized uh, your society is, you might control twenty percent of the efforts of your people, right? <clears throat> Whereas the rest of the effort will be controlled by, you know, just just the people, just the, the local people themselves over their own activity. Um, and so the idea is to be able to, to harness to, and, and create um, an ecological system and an economic system which uh, as closely, closely relates to reality as possible. Um, so a true trade system which um, revolves, on, revolves around supply, demand, and ease of transaction, right, transaction cost. <coughs> and... Um, <coughs> yeah, Kukumaru right now... Um, the idea of having like a CK2 type of system um, with actual dynasties and things like that um, would be something way down the line because we need to get, I know what you're saying, um, but we need to get the, the core concepts um, core concepts into shape before we move on to something uh, along those lines. <clears throat> yeah, Capitan, that's true. Something I think would be cool is having a centralization mechanic where you can have a large amount of control <coughs> over a relatively small sieve and then a small amount of control uh, as your sieve expands. Yeah, it's... And it's... One thing to keep, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that um, in, in, in Songs of the Aeons, the game is not, uh, is not like a race to the finish line like a lot of strategy games. Like you can see even here in Master of Magic, um, it's a lot like civilization where you start out with your one city and your one soldier and then you expand outward and you're racing against a whole bunch of other people with one city and one soldier. It's not like that. You're actually plopped into a random part of the life cycle of a world. Um, and some civilizations are more advanced, some are a lot weaker, but decay mechanics are are very pronounced in the game. So civilizations are constantly falling apart. Someone who's in the, in the Iron Age can collapse back into the Stone Age. Um, and so there's no, there's no kind of, of race where everyone's kind of racing toward the end game. 
<clears throat> because eventually, um, you know, regular disturbances roll in and can damage civilizations or destroy them or even destroy most of the world. Um, and, and most of the world may have to start over from scratch. This is supposed to be a very, like if, if you thought that Europa Universalis had a, a long game, um, <coughs> this game can hypothetically go on indefinitely in a single world. So you could, you could start out at a really early point in, in the life cycle of the world as a really primitive Neolithic hunter-gatherer type civilization, and you could go all the way to, to um, you know, to Renaissance era, a Renaissance era civilization, but then, you know, some kind of apocalyptic event could roll through, and the, the point of the game at that point would be surviving as much as you can with your advanced civilization. Most of your civilization would be wiped out. And if you wanted to, you could then continue on as, um, as, um, as kind of like a rump state of what you had before, and then kind of play in the ruins of, of your old civilization. Um, as, after the world has been transformed by apocalypse, right? <clears throat> but the idea, right, is that there are as many decay mechanisms as, um, as growth mechanisms. So <clears throat> the wilderness is always trying to encroach on you, and you are always, as a civilization, attempting to um, encroach on the wilderness. And as soon as civilization takes a hit, wilderness starts, starts to move back in and, and turn, turn everything feral once again. <clears throat> yeah, beaver with the top hat emoji. Yeah, and Kalak, um, culture is a huge part of the game. So cultures e will evolve through time um, based on based on the uh, environment that they happen to be in. And of course, you have the different races. So you have the fantasy, ra the various fantasy races. Um, each ones who tend to. Um, who tend to adapt? Who tend to be adapted to specific environments, right? So, elves prefer forests, humans prefer plains, that type of thing. But um, you know, a given race can adapt any kind of culture um, conceivable. So, you can have humans which develop a culture of living in forests as though they were elves, and elves living in plains as though they were humans, and they will still have a lot of the a lot of the basic features of, of elves, even though they might be living in plains, they might adapt an agra agrarian farming culture, but still be generally frail, intellectual, and, and dexterous, right? Um. <clears throat> yeah, and I know some people who wanted, um, who wanted historical will be a bit disappointed, but all of the concepts that exist in the game will be all real world concepts. So for instance, if you want to toggle off magic and toggle off fantasy races and create a world that looks like the real world, then it'll play out like the real world, like a real historical scenario. Um, that's the way that it's meant to be. And then if you want to toggle on high magic, you can, you can have that as well. Um, the idea is to get, make the game modular and um, highly moddable so anyone can create technically any kind of scenario that they want. Um, and the first iteration of the game is going to be probably no fantasy whatsoever. It's going to be, it could even theoretically be like, you know, a, a hypothetical, uh, hypo hypothetical historical game in, in some regionality of the world, like, like Armenia or, you know, in, in some kind of, some kind of valley setting. <clears throat> <laughs> streaming, watching a YouTube video. Um, I thought it'd be an active discussion. Good to have an active discussion. <coughs> and, um, <laughs> um, yeah, seeing a sieve grow a culture over time would be so cool if it's done right. Yeah, I think there's mu multicultural elements as well, and, you know, you'll set your own objectives. So maybe your objectives is to build an empire, which should be quite difficult due to the various decay mechanisms. Um, or it could be that you want to create, you know, a small civilization where, oh my God, orcs and humans are living in peace, you know, which would itself be highly challenging. <coughs> but yeah, you know, Kalak's talk, talk, <coughs> talking about race wars and things like that.
and ideally of it, you know, religion as well eventually. And the idea is that a lot of concepts in the game would be modular, like um, like uh, technology or races. So you might start up a game, and not every race would appear in a given game. You'd get certain types of races. Uh, maybe you happen to jump into a world where, for some reason, um, you have relatively barbaric races like gnolls who were able to actually create some kind of civilization. Maybe you end up in another world um, that's dominated by mountains and valleys, or another world that's do dominated by forests. You have all kinds of different situations, and even games where um, the you know the technologies aren't necessarily the same. So you don't you don't know what to expect every game, and you have to play every game as though it, as though you're playing it for the first time. <clears throat> yeah, Kukumaro, but that, that's the idea. If the world starts in a Neolithic stage, you will have to model the gradual domestication process of plants and animals. But yeah, that's exactly the idea. Um, <clears throat> when we first, so the first few iterations of the game, obviously we're going to have to start from the middle, right? We'd have to start from, you know, early medieval to late medieval and, ha and make a little mini game where you're playing within those parameters and have some ecosystem systems. No magic, no orcs or anything like that. First iteration of the game would, would be fairly, <clears throat> uh, fairly limited scale and not terribly ambitious, but the idea would be to, to um, build the core concepts of the game that the rest of the game is going to be, you know, the, the larger game is going to rely on eventually. <clears throat> this game is racist. Uh, yeah, there will be different paths, Kalax. So, depending on the culture of your people, you're going to be you're going to be pursuing different technological paths. Um, if you're a, if you're a, um, a warden race of elves living in the forest, you're not going to be um, you're not going to be pursuing the same kind of technological or cultural path that someone living in the plains or the desert or or on a or or sea people would necessarily develop. Then we start the cell stage like spore. Yeah, right. <clears throat> Can the player control the worlds? that are generated, can they control the world size? Yeah, I was, right, so you'd be able to, you know, when you want to make a new world, you can decide um, what kind of composition you might want to see in the world. I think game size would have to be static because when you're working with real ecosystems, size matters and it, it would get extremely difficult to balance a game if you had wildly varying um, map sizes. So that might not be, that might be not be practical. Alistar, you can choose, yeah, you would choose to be able to chop down the forest as elves if you want, but not if you start, if they start out being a true warden species. So and the idea, I was talking about this with uh, David Bunk earlier in the, um, in the inner circle. Um, and, um, and the idea is that, um, right, you have two, two major types of advancement as, a, as if you go civilized, right? You have the, um, ecosystem engineer clear the land type of strategy which is what humans have conventionally done right you chop down the forest and then you plant a bunch of crops and then you change the environment to have biomass that you personally can harness <clears throat> and then the other strategy is the management style strategy where um, you go into the forest and rather than chopping everything down you instead organize the forest into orchards um, and you uh, selectively breed the trees that are there to be more productive for your civilization. You take all the animals that are in the forest and instead of making them game to hunt, you, you make them um, you know, subservient to whatever your culture is doing. <clears throat> so for instance, high elves in the forest would, um, would be the managerial type of, 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 peop of culture where they would domesticate the land and everything, whereas uh, Wood elves would be the kind that wouldn't manage the land and would just kind of be living feral out, out in the landscape. But then if you want to, too, you could even theoretically have elves that chop down the forest and clear it and then, um, you know, make it into a type of plain situation. But that's not really the organic way it would necessarily happen. In the evolutionary history type of way that it would happen, um, elves would be forced out of the forest would have to live in the plains because that horrible dragon took over their forest and was eating them. And then the elves that are living in the plains develop a plains culture, move back into the forest, but since they already have a plains culture, they start to clear the forest to be more suitable 
uh, as planes, right? That would be the more natural way for them to happen. The same, same way with humans. Humans tend to do better in planes, um, but if for some reason they're, they're, you know, you know, orcish barbarians come in and, and kill them and dislocate them all and force them into the forest, then theoretically you could end up with a, a human culture in the forest, which becomes a warden society that, that manages the forest instead of chops it down. Um, <clears throat> let me catch up with everyone's comments. In Capitan, technological progress isn't necessary either. So, for instance, um, you could have Genghis Khan type cultures that are just, you know, roam around and, you know, and wreck stuff. Um, and you could have, you know, there's going to be different races, and certain races will um, be more more naturally capable to survive in the wilderness, whereas other races like humans tend to want to just try to change the uh, environment to be more suitable to themselves faster, right? Um, so your null types of um, your nullish type of races. Uh, can civilize, but they do it a lot slower, and they're much more they're much more able to fit into a wilderness type of situation uh, a lot easier. Uh, and so their technological progress uh, doesn't happen as quickly, and doesn't necessarily need to. But if if gnolls are able to develop a reasonably advanced society, they can be pretty terrifying because they now have good weapons and good armor um, that they didn't necessarily just have to steal from somebody else. Um, I mean, I was trying to send something to you the other day about an alternative to common heuristic pathfinding algorithms like A times pathfinding for calculating CE. Um, yeah, Discord. You can talk to me on Discord. Send me a chat there. New game developer. This means you would have a static genetic background and a variable culture both providing affinity to environments. That's that's correct, Kukumaru. Um, theoretically, you could have evolutionary mechanisms too, which would be the long, long-term type of stuff. Um, but that's a later down the line type of thing that would be, that would be done. <clears throat> so elves would retain all of their genetic affinities, um, but, you know, if they, if they um, pursue the specific culture type long enough, that could overwhelm a lot of their genetic affinities. But because of their genetic affinities, when you load up any given game, elves are more likely to survive and thrive in forests, therefore you see them in forests more often. Um, humans are much more likely to survive and thrive in plains, therefore you're more likely to see them living and thriving there, if that makes sense. <clears throat> Um, that's deterministic and also racist. Poor Knowles. <clears throat> the game's gonna be. I mean, the game's gonna be racist. Yeah, sorry. But Knowles can overcome their stupidity and. <laughs> yeah, but that could be that could be what you find fun in the game. You want to lead your Knowles to high society and high technology, and you want scholarly Knowles living in cities. Like uh, uh, that's. If that's the objective you have in the game for yourself, that can be your objective. And that could be fun, you know. <clears throat> and interbreeding. So there's, you know, there's going to be certain races who are more like other races. So, you know, when you're when you're conducting diplomacy with other societies, how well you get along with them will depend on two things, right? Um, how distant the different races are um, genetically from one another. Um, Right, so gnomes get along well with dwarves and <clears throat> and whatnot, but also and probably more importantly, culture, right? And so, you know, if um, if a group of you know, orcs and humans normally wouldn't get along very well, but if they both happen to converge on the same type of culture, then they could plausibly get along uh, reasonably well and plausibly even exist within the same culture together. The idea is that the um, 
the idea is that theoretically we can have whatever races we want, right? People can mod in their own races, um, and then you have a little ticker when you start up your new game. What races do I want to exist in this game? So if you want a full-on D&D style race, races all over the place, you could do that, right? That's the long-term perspective is you can end up bringing in, bringing in um, <coughs> community people to uh, help to create new content for the game. And the idea of the canon developers, which would be me and other people I eventually hire on, the canon developers would create the systems and the base races and stuff like that, and then we would be on the lookout for other, um, you know, other volunteers and modders and such who might want to try to get their races in the game. And that's, you know, I, that's what I'm seeing seven to ten years down the line. We basically hopefully be at that stage where we have a lot of the core mechanics in, a lot of the core economic ecosystem mechanics in, and it, it's a playable game, it's fun. At that point, we, you know, we have a much bigger community of people contributing and, um, and creating content which can be interchangeable in the game. And then you have a lower ranking system where you have modders who can add in whatever they want, but um, it's not part of the canon game. Right, so the, all the canon races would be balanced, you wouldn't have god races that are just awesome at everything, right? <laughs> the game on the screen, by, by the way, is Master of Magic. This is the game that inspired me as a kid to want to make my own game one day, except with real ecology and stuff like that. I remember, like, <clears throat> so in Master of Magic, there's ruins and stuff like that around the map, and monsters live there and everything, and sometimes they come out and raid your settlements and things like that. And I remember at the time as a kid wondering, like, oh, are they keeping, like, population variables there? Are they, is there, is there actually, like, communities of monsters there? Is, what, what's going on beneath the surface? And, of course, there wasn't, but I still, you know, I still thought it would be fascinating to create, create a game that simulated all of these actual things. So when you go into that dungeon to fight those monsters, you know that there's a history there, right? At some point, there was a civilization like yours that that lived in that burned out old city and at some point either something went wrong and the monsters moved in afterward or the monsters themselves were the ones that moved in killed everybody and then made it their home right <laughs> um, Alistair what do you mean by no fallen empire type civilizations fish person race <laughs> I think well that's the idea is you could have any type of Ideally, you'd want to gradually add in races so you could have whatever types of races that you wanted, you know. It would start out with your token-esque type of races because, to be honest, <coughs> that's what's going to create the most visibility as far as getting people interested in the game. You want to be familiar enough that people know what, what they're getting. But, um... Sticking a box that allows or not races to spawn doesn't seem like that would be in game. <clears throat> so there's there's a couple of things there, Petreo. The idea is that all races are always existing, at least in the background. Sparse, sparse numbers. So if you completely so with the initial build of the game, you would initially theoretically be able to wipe out all orcs. Um, but there would be some in the background that could settle some distant distant place and then get a foothold again long term 15 10 or 15 years down the line we could theoretically well maybe it may, may not even be that long we could theoretically create evolutionary mechanisms by which uh elves can come forth from orcs right um given enough time so let's say orcs ended up in the forest lived there for a thousand years Gradually, they could, over that period, or 10,000 years, they could gradually, those orcs could become elves if they adopted a warden culture for long enough. That would be an evolutionary me mechanism that wouldn't be that hard to make, but given how many other mechanisms we have, it may be something that would have to wait till later. <coughs> yeah, and that's possible too, Wargay have a poacher cultivator species instead of just a warden or destroyer. Yeah, a managerial species, right? And presumably, presumably there's continuums between these types of societies too. It's not just one or the other immediately. 
So, for instance, you could have a civilization where half of your human, half of your half of your people live near the forest, half live in the plains. Um, you are man. You are a, You have enough control. Of, your government has enough control that you're able to control both of them. And so your culture would be part part rangerish and part civilized in the plains. Um, holding it together would be harder though, because holding together multiple cultures um, is is more likely to result in disintegration when something goes wrong. So, for instance, someone comes in, attacks, and loots the capital of your half ranger, half plains society. Um, that could loosen your control on the ranger aspect, and then they could break off and become their own society. You know, if you're unable to exert enough control. And that's part of that nature. We, we really want to build in decay mechanisms like that, where it's not just like they're they're made as an afterthought. We want the decay mechanisms to be fleshed out and work in the same vein as the growth and empire building mechanisms as well. So it's not just like an, an afterthought. <coughs> yeah, coding language, you're figuring out coding languages. Um, C++ seems like it's getting to be a better and better bet. Trying to figure out what to do as far as engines. Um, but there's, yeah, as David Bunk said, C++ more than likely. <coughs> yeah, Kalak, and there can be, in the future, you know, we'd like to have a system by which you have, for instance, a subterranean layer for like your dwarves and stuff like that, but also have things like, you know, a magical realm too, a layer where you have ley lines, you know, Ley lines, you know, going through the environment that you can only see after you gain some magical aptitude, stuff like that. Um, let's see. A good source would be Peter Tuchin, who's been studying societies as organisms using mathematical models. The branch of history, let's say, is called cleodynamics. Yeah, it's very interesting. Jan Compi. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just, just took a look at Twitch. Um, so really the opening phases of the game is really going to be, you know, what we're developing. It's going to revolve. There's going to be no <coughs> pretty much going to be no civilization whatsoever when we first start building it. It's mainly going to be procedurally generating a geography. Uh, initially, there's going to be no dynamic geography. It'll be static for a while. Um, but then we're going to be we're going to build the ecosystem layer. We're going to have the um, the growth of the ecosystems competing with one another, um, and then we'll probably work in the um, um, the wilderness species, um, which don't don't ever become civilized, and then gradually work into uh, work into the equation the civilized species, um, which technically all work by the same principles, um, and then from there. We work on player agency because beneath the surface, um, a lot of what's going to be driving growth and progress is going to be, you know, m thousands and thousands of miniature AIs making making small small decisions, um, you know, on a tile by tile basis. And then your job will be to come in and do things to to influence the way your people grow, and and, and the kind of character that they take on, and of course defending your people and, and things like that. Yeah, Wargy, um, only select people will be making it into the Canon Deep team. Um, if people want to self-teach and contribute and just make stuff and say, hey, check it out, <clears throat> that's great. You know, I'm not going to sign anyone on who hasn't proven themselves. Um, and you know, what will really matter in the long term is if we can raise the funds, A, for me to do this full time, but B, for me to at least pay pay development members some token amount of, of money for their efforts. That's when it really becomes serious. Um, if the new game developer fails completely and I don't raise any money and everyone loses interest, I'm still going to be working on this game. It's just going to be Demian working in his garage slowly as a hobby, you know, because I still find it fun. I still find the process of coding and building things exciting. So.
one way or another, I'm going forward with it. Just depends on how much um, the, the rate of which depends on how much you know funds I can raise. Um, <clears throat> of course, in that vein, if you want to support somehow, there is my Patreon. Um, some rewards come with the Patreon <coughs> based on your level of contribution. Um, I, I try to listen to everybody's ideas positively, um, but people who obviously are higher ranking due to their Patreon position um, tend to get mo noticed more and they have their own special channels in, um, in Discord. So you can see here we have the oligarchy who is everyone who is a uh, journeyman and above. Then there's the inner circle, who is everyone who is inner circle and above. Um, and then the general channel and the um, songs of the Aeons channel. <clears throat> you can see already I'm, I'm participating in both of those, but um, you know, people who are higher ranking um, you know, get, um, tend to get more attention. Um, and then of course, I think I'm, I may have enough views now on Twitch to officially, um, to officially, uh, get subscribers. I'm not entirely sure. I'll have to look into that. If anyone else knows about that, please let me know. But getting subscribers on Twitch is obviously another way to, <coughs> to plausibly finance the game, which would be great. Um, Jane Kempe, if you'd like swing by I'm, I'm reading what you're saying on twitch i'd like to go into it in more details in more detail but if you want to discuss it in more detail swing by um oh cool someone's doing someone's doing artwork yeah. i like it hey kumbai makun mekanahirahala so yeah, you can you can see if you want to if you want to chat you can come to general. Hmm. <laughs> awesome. <coughs> but yeah, as you can see, I mean, we already have. Um, I'm really having a lot of fun already with the community that we built for uh, the noob game developer. Um, it's developing its own little culture and. Um, it's kind of become a little addictive in a way. It's nice to be able to, you know, swing by on a regular basis and talk to everybody. Um, yeah, Quentin, I need to unify the chat. There's a way to do it, so um, I'll be able to do that pretty soon. <coughs> There's only so much. I'm. I mean, I've been I've been working a lot on all of the various peripheral, you know, new game developer stuff to get all the infrastructure in place. We actually. So we already have some some pretty involved moderators, um, and also we have um, we have someone David Bunk who's um, stepped up quite a bit. He's going to be experimenting with a lot of a lot of code and stuff like that, and trying to make a little mini engine and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and then we also have a marketer too, Richard Shrew, <coughs> who's helped me organize my YouTube page and monetize and stuff like that. So props to him as well. So it's, it's kind of, I mean, the, the project itself is coming along rather nicely, um, which is one of the reasons I've gotten a little distracted from MNT 2.0 because things are, uh, things are getting pretty interesting with the new game developer. That am going to get back to me on taxes, I promise. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah Jonathan, game probably have stability system that will take years to occur. Yeah, instead of having... So in Songs of the Aeons, instead of having just one stability score, instead you'll have like the cultural harmony of your people. How how culturally harmonious are your people? You'll have whether your realm is financially stable, whether people are going hungry, whether there's surplus food. There'll be all of those variables rather than just some composite score which is has general meaning, you know. That's the point of a simulator, right? And if there's not enough stability, things start to fall apart, you know. A city over there breaks away. Um, <clears throat> you know, you have internal issues over you know cultural identity and things like that. You know, if if your the elves and humans that were living together harmoniously, you know, if there's if there's disturbances and instability in various venues, then suddenly they might not be getting along quite as well. You know. Yeah, canals don't code themselves. I will get to it. I promise. 
and of course we will we are planning on having some some tactical battles in songs of the aeons um but it is not going to be like total war at all um it's going to be much more realistic in the sense that you don't have complete control over all of your units first off most of the soldiers you get you don't just you don't just choose you get what you get right when you go to war <clears throat> you give a call to arms um, and then whoever is capable of carrying a weapon and whoever wants to actually fight will show up to fight and so you'll have like your professional army with your elite cavalry and stuff like that but when you have a an all-out war and you declare a call to arms you know you get whatever your people have so if you have mostly just dirt eating peasants you shove a spear and a wooden shield into their hands and you have masses of peasants right um, if you have a lot of iron in your society, then those peasants might be showing up with some decent swords and maybe even some basic armor, right? Yeah, and Alistar, how do these systems deal with overlap? So the idea is to not make a bunch of overlapping systems. The idea is to make one foundational system from which all other aspects arise, right? So Europa Universalis has tons of disparate systems that don't really connect to each other, right? And in Mew and Taxes 2.0, my objective was to try to combine them <coughs> in such a way that they were um, uh, that they were all technically arising from the same the same system. Um, you know, things like religion, culture, and politics. That's down the line, right? We have to get the foundational stuff in first, right? Your your geography your um, <clears throat> ecology, basic growth patterns. Once you've established all of that, <clears throat> then you can build on top of that system, your diplomacy, um, <clears throat> your culture and things of that nature. And that will be tied into those underlying variables down beneath. Um, so <clears throat> let's take a really quick break, okay? I need, <coughs> or it kind of messed up my voice. I got to get something, uh, something to soothe my throat. So I'll be right back. Mr. Chair will take the floor.
Okay. Yeah, we could definitely use artists and arts, by the way. <coughs> Flopsy. Oh, hey, Flopsy. Um, right, so the kind of game that I'm developing. <laughs> it's got applesauce all over myself. Excuse me. I got something elbow in my throat. Yeah, cowboy dang, that's a pretty good pretty good summary there. <laughs> um yeah, so I mean, to put it simply, um, you know, the objective long term is to create the ultimate fantasy simulator. And the idea, fantasy strategy simulator. Um, take real, real world, real world principles of right ecology, geology, economics. Put them into play, and um, preside over the evolution of your society over hundreds of years, and eventually its decline and uh, the the legacy that it leaves. Um, yeah, Alistair, um, that was one of the things I actually kind of wanted to achieve with this stream. I'm not sure it's going to happen, though. Um, it was to come up with um, a framework for a unified um, for a unified design document. So there is, um, I know Discord is chaotic, but um, you can see in Songs of the Aeons, there's actually a pin section right here. I, I kind of read to you guys earlier. It's a bit short. The idea is on the forums, I'm going to, here, let me grab it real quick. Let's see. <clears throat> is I'm going to have a section here, right? Songs of the Aeon's core concepts. And I'm going to make threads. The first thread is going to be the overarching, um, the overarching uh, design philosophy and what the game's supposed to be about. Um, then people can comment on it. It'll be it'll be pinned, um, and then over time, I'm going to release additional um, additional uh, threads along the same vein, exploring specific mechanics. Um, we can all discuss it, refine the concepts, um, and revise them over time as as people give feedback. Um, and then, of course, you know, we'll be moving into production mode. Um, a lot of my actual development um, time, active development, is going to be um, geared toward Mayo and Texas 2.0 for a while still. Um, but I'm gradually going to start to shift over um, once things fall into place over there. <clears throat> Describe SOT in 20 words or less. Let's do that right now. Let's come up with let's come up with 20 words. I mean 20 words or less. Um SOT is a living One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. <coughs> Roughly twenty. SOT is a living world simulator, living fantasy world simulator where the player Yes, Discord is difficult. That's why we do have the forums, guys, by the way, for a much more slower paced um, type of thing. Discord is generally more for um, people people that are already part, you know, steeped in the community. 
See, the idea is I want to be able to have a response for people when they say, hey, I just heard about this game you're making. What's it about, right? And then have something like this. I mean, I do have this right here, but it's kind of something I just wrote on the fly. So, you know, feel free to give me some ideas as far as, uh, as what you think would be a better... Um, a better uh, way to deal with it. <clears throat> it's only 17 words. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay. SOT. <laughs> and stuff things. Yeah, I agree, Peter. And that's why, you know. That's why I didn't dare run the stream before we had an official, an official forums, right? <clears throat> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out because it's kind of a big deal. I'm trying to figure out what the best way to go about when someone asks what this game is about. The best way to present it to them. Um, you obviously have like the twenty word statement, but then they'll they might be like, "Well, cool." What else? More details, right? So I'm guessing with a design document, <clears throat> or, you know, to answer people's questions, you go, boom, you got the initial thing, right? And then they're like, oh, I would like more details about this initial thing. So then they get, you know, something more like this, which is a page long. Um, I'm not quite satisfied with what I have here. Um, and then it's like, cool, I want to know even more than they go to the forum <clears throat> or they dig deeper into the forum and then they can go into more topics. I st started the forum like today, by the way, it's been up for a while, but I didn't open it to anyone until yesterday. I think so there's, there's some discussions going on, but it's just now getting off the, off the ground. He has a fantasy world simulator where the player guides the society. That sounds too, you know, Alistair sounds like it, it sounds like it could be Age of Wonders 3, right? It doesn't seem like enough to say society from humble origins to towering heights. That's every strategy game anyone has ever played, ever. You know, the only thing that's even different about that is the whole f fantasy simulator. <clears throat> that's why living. Terms like that to convey that there's more that's going on other than just the player acting on an inert canvas, right? The idea, the true power of a simulator is that it gives the player the perception that their deeds matter, right? That there's stuff going on in the world, irrelevant of them, but then they can step in and then they can, they can change it. You know, from what it was, you know, to to, to what you want it to be, um, as opposed to just being a bunch of monsters standing around waiting for the player to come whack them, it doesn't feel like you've changed the world in any significant way. <clears throat> Realistic magic world simulator sandbox. Yeah, Kukumaro, those are keywords that would definitely capture the essence. So. Um, Let's see. I guess fantasy kind of captures magic. Sandbox. <clears throat> that, I think, is a key word. Actually, Kukumaru is a living fantasy world simulator with a player. How do, how do we convey that here? <clears throat> okay, let's try again. In SOT, the player presides over the evolution of their society in a living, breathing, a living fantasy world simulator in a 
living. I'm trying to figure out where to put the sandbox. <coughs> Instead of discussing, we all talk about grammar. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for helping. Thanks for being so insightful. Mega, the game can start... So your question is, at which time period equivalent to the real world will your game start be? It'll be any time. You can jump in at any time because the world lasts forever, right? So it's constantly... The world is in a cycle of growth and destruction, growth and destruction. Sometimes the destruction is a little bit. Sometimes it's immense. Um, so if you jump in immediately after destruction, after an apocalyptic event, then you are jumping into a Neolithic type of setting where you are kind of roaming around trying to create the vestige of some kind of civilization. And at that time, you're roaming through the ruins of all of the civilizations that just got wrecked, you know. And so you're trying to find some alcove from which to, to create a civilization. <coughs> exactly, that gets them to look at it. The idea of real ecological simulation is so foreign to players that they won't be able to capture it in one word. Exactly, that's the problem I'm... Instead of living... Well, living... Because living, living could work because it conveys a lot of things in one word. It's very concise, you know. Like, is, <coughs> is civilization five or six a living world? Not really, not, not the way you would typically understand. Is Age of Wonders three a living world? Not really. Is even Europa Universalis four vanilla a living world? Yeah, doesn't really come across that way, right? Rational. Hmm. Rational can be ambiguous, though, too. Make living into your brand, and that takes more than 20 words. <coughs> Mega, uh, magic is toggleable on or off. You can live in a, you can play in a purely no magic situation, and it'll be much, just much more like real, real, real life. You could even turn the apocalypse off and make it just a historical game based on those principles. So. That means voice echoing in the background? Maybe. Let me see. That may help. <clears throat> hmm. And the thing, the thing to consider is even with, even with the magic that would be toggled on, who knows when we'll get around to magic? That's like one of the late, late years down the line, you know. So it'll look much more like an actual historical game or a real life type of game <clears throat> than it would fantasy. But the idea is you create. A real world and then the magic just taps into what's to the real variables that are there right magic isn't a mystical force that's not understood it's only mystical to the actual people inside the game right because they just don't understand it yet <clears throat> so magic just is kind of you get to amend the laws of of the current physics right this is how it reaches in <clears throat> Um. This is <laughs> super accurate um, fantasy simulator for real. Um, let me catch up with the conversation here. Maybe the thing to do is brainstorm the way you want to describe the simulation philosophy. Um, I think that rationale covers the, that better. Magic isn't really realistic as such, but if you obey rules, exactly that. Magic is not <clears throat> is not a, a way to cheat. Um, you know the laws of physics; they are part of the laws of physics. So that I mean, the idea is to if you have a magic system, that magic 
is governed by laws of physics, right? And integrated into laws of physics in the game. And so if you remove it, then nothing is missing because you're just not able to change the base laws of physics. Oh, game deep because of the trigger happy Twitch mods. Yeah, I didn't even realize that. How do I, let's see. I am in Twitch. Okay, I'm not playing Europe Universalis 4. I'm going to edit that. <coughs> um, game Deep. Is that even a thing? It's game development. Okay. Creative. I'm doing creative. There we go. I just had to change it. Magic functions like industrial relation. It breaks the hard limit of the productivity of manual labor. <laughs> okay, I'm caught up with comments. I think mostly which site to use, either YouTube or Twitch, for your mainstream site. Which is use Twitch that is designed for streaming and poured over the YouTube. Um, yeah, okay, I moved it out. Okay, so we're caught up now. So we need the opening. <clears throat> opening statement here. In SOT, the player presides over the evolution of the society in living sans box style fantasy world. A whole lot of adjectives there. Yeah, Kukumara, that's a good summary. It'd be like treating electromagnetism as magic. <coughs> um, people um, people always use the example of Dwarf Fortress, but it's not, it, it sounds similar, but it's not really doing the same thing. It only appears similar in the, in the depth and breadth. Because remember, Dwarf Fortress isn't, it is not an empire building strategy game. It is at its base more of a RPG-ish type of game. Um, so there's, there's a lot of differences in, <clears throat> and Dwarf Fortress doesn't do, um, doesn't, doesn't do its ecological model very much at all like, like what I'm going to be doing, which is more true ecology. Um, but I mean, it is similar in the sense that it is a long-term project that is very deep, takes a lot of time, is a fantasy setting, is building a world, but, um, the gameplay should be substantially different than Dwarf Fortress. Yeah, the Mongols are Mongols are there. Um, and not to mention, Dwarf Fortress doesn't like have any graphics. <laughs> All right. And that's what the player presides. Uh, more, yeah, more. Yeah, it, it could be. Um, well, imagine feel like paying mana to bring better weather. Yeah, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> let me try and get back to this mission statement. Um, this, what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to eat this cheese, but I'd also like to uh, to formally create a. Uh, a good design document that we can refer people to whenever anyone's interested and like, oh, uh, what's this game about? So, yeah, let's see. <clears throat> Preside, yeah, that's not the right. <clears throat> it's SOT, SOTE. Um, the player, <coughs> hmm. yeah, mana is too universal of a currency anyway. Mmm, jeez. Mmm.
Well, the idea with the magic system eventually is to have it be a different, a little bit different in its nature each each game about you know what it's capable of doing. That way, there isn't too much meta gaming, but um, and you would kind of rediscover how magic works each time you played. <laughs> um, thank you, Alistar. Mm, shapes. I like shapes. The player shapes the evolution of their society through the eons in a living sandbox style fantasy world simulator. Ah, oh, cheese. I don't want to get the rest of my cheese. Mm -hmm. Yeah, magic. Doo! A long way into the future. Um, we'll almost certainly have a build of the game before we get to magic. Uh, hey, Demian might want to move Twitch stream out of Euphoria. Did that? <clears throat> I dare to. Oh God, you people and your pronunciation stuff. Okay, Jin Kempei, I dare to write a few questions to answer in game synopsis and Discord. Those are basic things to answer at this phase of design. Um. I did it because this is a time when he has ideas, but he needs to collect them and really put them together. Yeah, well, this is, yeah, this is kind of, that's kind of what we're doing <laughs> right now, I guess. Um, one other idea is that as you get bigger, like in TK2, you have to place administrative reason giving you less micromanage. Yeah, Wargy, that's, <clears throat> so that's, you know, Dave and I were talking about the logic, um, the logic beneath how um, how a lot of this is going to be coded, and um, and how we're going to create dynamic geopolitical provinces, um, which uh, will be used for a lot of calculations, which will determine how how things can fragment, um, and um, and how they're organized. So as you get bigger, um, you're not doing a lot of the otherwise dinky, small, stupid stuff that you're normally doing at a, at a smaller smaller layer of the game. Um, so when you're, when you're just that hunter-gatherer tribe roaming around with a few hundred individuals, you're doing a lot more micromanagey type of things than you would be doing when you're an empire. Because when you're an empire, you're not looking at each group of 100 people, you know, influencing its, its behavior and stuff like that. <coughs> Um, yeah, Peter Weiss and yeah, talking about magic. Um, we talked about it in the previous discussion now. When we get around to magic, magic will be different each time, and and the mythology of what happens when people die will be different each time. And it'll be kind of it'll be scrambled up, so you kind of have to rediscover it each each game. Right. Um. But, um, yeah, so, so, yeah, mission statement, um, I mean, I kind of have a mission statement on the Patreon list, but it's, it has as much to do with the project of the new game developer as it does uh, about the game itself. Um, I think what's needed is what I was trying to get at here. In discussing, um, <clears throat> in discussing all the major features and what we intend to do, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So gotta sort that out. So first sentence in in SOTE, the player shapes the evolution of their society through the ands, through the ands. 
in a living sandbox style fantasy world simulator. That's the basic statement. And then from there, <coughs> move on to more detail. So Mr. Dano, we were just discussing various aspects of the game, as well as an opening mission statement. <laughs> so what is the player a world geist? No, the player is just um, is the governing force of a specific uh, political unit at a given time, right? So <coughs> <coughs> sorry. So the governor of like a country, or governor of a, or the, the chief of a tribe, you know. Right, so you're not, you're not a world geist at all. You're not. Oh, that's true. Right, so it's. I see what you mean here. As far, as, yeah, I guess it. <coughs> it's not really clear. The player shapes the evolution, right? So you could be a demigod or something. Yeah, Kukumaro, that's why eventually, you know, your society ceases to exist and you lose the game. And it's a, it's kind of like Dwarf Fortress in the same regard in that, um, right, <laughs> you lose eventually. Sure, the deciding force, the dominant, the dominant force of the government at any given moment would be the... I guess it's the best way to describe what you are. Right, because you, presumably you can have internal discord and turmoil and stuff like that in the government, so. Um, right, which is not you directly. A civic god? That's an interesting concept, but I don't know. I mean, this is the... Right, so this is always the ambiguous aspect of any strategy game. What are you, right? Are you... It's... It's more clear in a game like Crusader Kings 2... Um, because you're like, oh, I am the king, I am the queen, whatever. Um, <coughs> hmm. I think being an actual god, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that would, don't know if that would necessarily work because the things that you are doing are not the things that a god would do, it's what a government would do. A god doesn't say, ah, oh, build a canal here, build a road here. <clears throat> uh, a god doesn't say, to arms, we shall go off and fight a battle. And that, those are the kinds of things that you, that you do. Um, so it's just not what a god would, god doesn't really fit. <clears throat> right, Wargy, that's, I guess that's kind of a way to look at it. So you're going to be a king in a feudal society, but a parliamentary gov democracy will be cab be the cabinet. <coughs> I think that's a reasonable way to put it. Yeah, Guli Gulami Fusion Winter. I think the assumption here is that you will always be the dominant force at any given moment. So if the government is taken over by mm -hmm some other type of governing force then you would you know from within then you would become that dominant force otherwise it'd be too many too many ways to lose the game way too quickly right same thing with europa universalis 4 right 
the pretender takes over. Oh, you have a new you have a new ruler, and so you you kind of are them now. now. Yeah, I have seen black and white. I played it back in the day. <coughs> Well, yeah, so, but, so, I guess it's, so it's similar to Europa Universalis 4, but does Europa Universalis 4 ever say, aha, you are a dynastic spirit of the nation? I mean, I mean, how, how does that get presented, right? I think, I mean, it's, it's necessary to establish it for point of view, reasons, but then there's the whole how do you explain it to people type of thing. Um, the problem with the problem with um, creating a system by which you can be dethroned and then you're a minority in the government is you end up spending tons of time sitting around, but not only that, but then you have to build the system for that too, which is, which, which, which would take a lot of time. <clears throat> and so I think the practical way to go about it is to assume that your government, what, what you play as is, you know, the, the majority of the government at any given moment, the, the most powerful force in the government. And at times it may be toothless and need to consolidate power, and at other times it, it could be, um, you know, quite formidable. Guliam, um... I would say your identity changes based on just <clears throat> so if you go from being if, you, if, if your country goes from being a loose confederacy to an absolute monarchy yeah your, your identity kind of changes and that is reflected in the fact that you have way more control per capita than you did before over people's activities The American pronunciation is strong. <coughs> Gulian, Gulian, <laughs> Gulian Kappa, William. <laughs> is that how it is supposed to sound, William? <laughs> anyway, anyway, um. So, getting a little bit in, into the weeds, um, I think it's <coughs> excuse me, pretty concisely, I'm pretty sure it needs, um, the, the simplest way is to go with the dominant, dominant force in the government that I've been saying. Yeah, and warfare is significantly less important. And warfare is supposed to be significantly different, um, significantly different than it is in most games. I mean, mo most games are geared toward conquest, conquest, con con conquest. All the game features are basically geared, steered into the fact that you're supposed to build the biggest empire you can and swallow as much land as you can. But that's really not not the objective in game. Um, right. So it's it's much more supposed to be about the thing is, things happen more slowly, too. Um, let's see. But, um, anyway, getting a little off track here. I may end the stream. <coughs> I might try and... <coughs> Sorry. First, my, my voice is going away. Second... Wanted to try to get get this done today. The general mission statement. Probably not going to be practical to do it um, here on the stream, but at least I got it out there and, and everyone's aware of, of what I'm working on here. Um, but yeah, will we get ponies at the end? It depends. <coughs> it depends on what Ellie's up to. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's warfare is a means to the end. It won't be the end. Um, <coughs> I 
exactly where, where you surely them you decide which path you wish to lead so you could be the world police or a tiny trade city that's the idea in the game it's supposed to be a sandbox right it's not okay if you want to create your vast massive empire then uh, <coughs> that's one thing you could do if you wanted to create that you know that recluse you know mysterious city up in the mountains you can do that too you know Yeah, Kazarius, these are both aspects of what we plan on having. Nations collapse and others emerge from the ashes. Um, collapse is all a part, is, is a huge part of the game. Um, also, there'll be some sort of dynamic culture shifting. Yep, dynamic culture shifting for sure. Um, there is no end either. There's no victory cards. <clears throat> I'm thinking... The idea is to come up with a way to actually document what you've done during your game to measure some degree of success. Um, like leave some kind of legacy behind based on um, based on what you've done in the game. And to make, make the metric of success not being big, but having made an interesting story. So for instance, um, if you build a vast empire, that could be a fairly dull story if it's just one success after another. But if you went from being a massive empire to a city-state, and then you won an epic 1-10 to 10 battle, and then fought your way back out and claimed victory, that would be a great story. You know, Even though fewer people marched off to war and you didn't grow as big, that's a more interesting story. And so I'm thinking the metric of success can be what kind of interesting game you played during the time that you were there, right? That is one of the songs that is heard throughout the aeons, right? <clears throat> and massive monuments and all that's going to be, you know, part of the, the point. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Komemos. If your society ends, you could then continue on as a tiny rump state. So let's say you're a massive empire. Your entire society apparently gets obliterated by <clears throat> by Genghis Khan or something of the orcs, right? <clears throat> you could play as some as one of the small rump states of people that fled to some other place and then you know rebuild a society. You know, you, or even if you're completely wiped out. Um, the game world can be allowed to age for a while and then you can jump back in as some other civilization. Um, you know, starting a fresh, a fresh start. And then you, you would see, you know, how things have changed since that, since that time. <clears throat> so yeah, the idea is there should be, <clears throat> you should not feel rushed in this game. Like, I remember in EU4 Vanilla, like, I had this feeling if I, did, if I was playing and I hadn't conquered 150 provinces in the first 100 years, I'd be like, oh, I'm not playing as good as I could. Because the only metric of success is to conquer the crap out of everything. But the idea in Songs of the Aeons is that you don't know when the apocalypse is coming. You don't know when the next <clears throat> disturbance is coming. If you try to expand too quickly, you could just as easily be slapped down, you know, in because you expanded too quickly and there was some disturbance that caused you to collapse. So the idea is you, you take your time, you do the things you want to do and not feel rushed by the game itself, right? You're not rushed by an end date. You're not rushed by some metric, universal metric of success. Um, you choose your own goals, you do your own things, right? So your goal one game might be, hey, I want to start a multi-racial society of these different races, you know, have them all getting along and I want to have my, you know, my knowledge pikemen and my human wizards and stuff like that. That could be what you want to do, right? Or you could, you could want to play as a group of human barbarians and unite all of the hordes throughout the world and, and, and loot the world, you know, and that would make a great song. It makes a great story. And these are all the things that, you know, all the different things you could want to do. <laughs> yeah, Paolo, that, I guess that's a good summary. <clears throat> Victoria 2, Mayo Civ, Mountain Blade, World Sim. Cool.
Yeah, true. Um, how does one occupy this time when not in war? Will there be flavor mechanics regarding sociocultural policies, building projects, etc.? <clears throat> yeah, so a lot of it is going to revolve around um, peacetime mechanics, right? Um, the ways that you guide and improve your civilization. Um, I was even contemplating other things like, um, you know, adventurism mechanics where you, you know, you have as part of your, part of your professional military, um, like people you can send out exploring distant places or, <clears throat> or conducting diplomatic missions or things like that. Um, yeah, this will be the game that changes the way strategy games are made. That's the thing is, I mean, it, cosmetically it looks probably similar to a lot of other games on the surface. Deep down inside, though, you know, I'm 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 aiming for it to do things that have never been done before. Most of the time, every game comes down to being an abstraction in one way or another. Whereas this simulates all of the underlying mechanics, and rather than <coughs> scripting a whole bunch of them a whole bunch of different things and a whole bunch of different mechanics you create a lot of rich generalized mechanics which create emergent storylines and emergent uh, mechanics all around um, so yeah that's the idea <clears throat> try to work on this if my voice is any good over the weekend I'll try to make MNT 2.0 tutorial videos if it is no good over the weekend, I'm, I'm going to try and work on some more new game developer stuff. Revolutionary concept. You don't need to kill everyone around you to be successful. Yeah, in warfare, warfare, I'd like so much more to be about not necessarily conquering. Yeah, I mean, you can still do that. But also, what it was for so much of history, which was, which was raiding, which was... Um, you know, basically just theft. You know, even civilized nations often just went off the war to steal the stuff from their enemies and weaken them you know i don't like you we're gonna go to war i'm gonna raid your cities and so you can go to war and lose a war and not like lose your entire civilization you know or vice versa <clears throat> Yeah, Kazarius, the idea is right now, um, you know, rely, as we're, as we're in the hatching phase of concepts, like, we, <clears throat> you obviously can't launch a Kickstarter at this point and expect people to contribute. But I think people who are familiar with my work in MIT 2.0, uh, you know, some people would be able to, you know, contribute to the Patreon because they, <clears throat> they believe in the long-term dream. Um, and then once we have, once we've kind of proven ourselves move more toward, you know, more monetization, uh, broader monetization strategy. Um, um, yeah, the issue with this game is obviously it just takes an incredible amount of time. And no one, no one in a publicly traded company would ever have the patience here, let me invest, you know, X amount of dollars for something I'm not going to see any return on investment for for years and years and years, you know. Um, and so this game, kind of like Dwarf Fortress and, <clears throat> and Unreal World and games like that, could only exist, you know, as as games which are not, which can make the developer a living, but which is not going to make anyone rich, you know. And which takes a lot of time and patience. And so that's that's the objective here. Um, how is the best way to begin coding your mind, Dem? You mean for you or for me? <laughs> up in the Discord, see what's going on in here. Private conversations, hmm. Oh yeah, I need to switch my tag on that. 
Hmm. Okay, cool. I have to check that out. Okay. I'm going to put that someplace safe so I don't lose it. <coughs> For you. Uh, yes. That's So Peter gave the remark I would give. Um, the first step is find something that you want to work on that you find incredibly interesting that you would be willing to get up every day and enjoy doing. Because if you have to force yourself to code or you have to force yourself to work on something, I don't think it's going to happen. It couldn't happen for me that way. So. Um. <laughs> Enjoy lunch, Mr. Daniel. Interesting. Player dozen game was core idea. Yeah, we've done this. We need to formalize it and um, write it in the form. Anyway, I guess we shouldn't beleaguer the point here. I think we've covered just about what we're going to cover. Uh, it's dawned on me that it's going to be too difficult to write up something uh, during a stream and my voice is going and it's been two hours already so I guess <coughs> I guess we can pretty much call at this point and um, um, so yeah go ahead and uh, if you haven't already swing by the forums swing by discord for the various conversations uh, We'll have more and more fleshed out as time goes on. And uh, the first step has been taken. That is correct. The first few steps. It's deceptive, but a lot of work has gone into all the various meta development of new game stuff. So anyway, see you guys later. <laughs> Here are the Mongols. I'm going to go play with my Mongols. See you guys.